All right, well, thank you. Uh, hello and welcome. Uh, I want to stay, start by uh, stating that we're gathered here, some of us on, uh, all of us utilizing the resources extracted from the traditional territories of the neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples, uh, caretakers of this land since time immemorial. Um, I hope that in addition to acknowledging this fact and how we benefit from this ongoing colonial displacement, uh, this series of speakers and workshops of which this panel is part of, uh, will help move us towards more concrete action for reconciliation uh, by learning about and exploring how power and privilege are implicated in our professional values and in our practices. Uh, given my positionality as a cisgendered man, as a person of East Asian heritage who's often treated as white, uh, as a disabled person, but also as a person with a relative privilege of employment security, uh, given my positionality, I try to understand my own work as contributing to the social good. Um, and if that work doesn't include or address those pushed to the margins of our society, uh, then who is it really doing work for? Uh, I do not want to be the intellectual wing. Uh, I hope nobody here wants to be the intellectual wing of white settler colonialism, white supremacy, and heteropatriarchy. Uh, and I hope that this ADE for Games Community series of speakers and workshops funded by a SHRC grant, generously supported by the Games Institute and led by myself and Dr. Daniel Harley, uh, that this panel in particular can help us become more reflexive about our, about our relationships with our fellow researchers uh, and with everyone who we share society. Today, I'm pleased to introduce our panel on emerging voices in Black game studies and introduce you to three exceptional early career researchers. Um, I'll speak briefly about all of them before inviting them one after the other to uh, give their presentations. Uh, I'll ask us to hold all questions for the end of the final presentation, at which point um, uh, we'll engage them in some conversation. Please feel to put any questions you have in the chat uh, if you're joining us from online um, or to uh, raise your hand when we get to the discussion period at the end if you're here with us in person. Um, the, uh, the first presentation will be by Dr. Keel Fletcher, uh, an award-winning anthropologist and Kotzen postdoctoral fellow in the Society of Fellows at Princeton University. Uh, his research crosses the disciplinary borders of anthropology, African-American studies, and game studies to explore the lived experiences of Black individuals in online gaming spaces. Fletcher earned his PhD in anthropology from the University of California at Irvine, where his work was funded by a National Science Foundation as well as the University of California. Uh, our second talk will be by Cyan DeVoe, a third year PhD candidate in communication at Stanford University. She researches the psychological, behavioral, and sociocultural implications of augmented reality and virtual reality, examining identity, culture, and embodiment, and embodiment in social AR and VR. A member of the Virtual Human Interaction Lab and the Human Computer Interaction Group at Stanford, DeVoe is a recipient of several prestigious fellowships, including the National Science Foundation Graduate Research Fellowship. Our final talk will be by Stephen Daschle. He's a visiting researcher at the Games Center at American University. His work focuses on the sociology of language and the nature of discourse in male-dominated spaces, notably gaming, military, brony, and other subcultures. He holds a PhD in language, literacy, and culture from the University of Maryland and has published research, including a stellar set of five peer reviewed journal articles in 2022 and another three so far in 2023 um, concerning online game discourse, masculinity, um, and gaming practices in, among other places, the Journal of Men's Studies, Sexuality and Culture, uh, Games and Culture, uh, as, as well as other leading journals. Um, I'm happy to uh, uh, turn the mic over to the first presentation uh, by Dr. Neil Fletcher. Thank you. Hi, good morning, everyone. Let give me a second to set this up. OK, everyone can hear and see me OK, or rather the, the screen at least. Yep. Yeah. Yes, we can. Okay. Fantastic. OK, so like Gerald was wonderful enough to give that presentation for, my name is Akil Fletcher. Akil is fine. 
And I am super happy to be here. Honestly, very surprised when Joe reached out. I was like, hey, do you want to be on a panel for Emerging Voices? I was like, am I an emerging voice? Here we are. Yeah. Now, <laughs> today, I am a person that cares more for conversation than lecturing. So I'm going to keep my presentation fairly short. And I thought what would be generative for today's conversation would actually be just to talk a bit about uh, one of the book projects that I'm working on and talk about the ways in which it's influencing my thought. And hopefully that is generative for the conversation today. So I'm happy to take any questions about that, but I would be even more happy if it gets us to talk about some really dope things today. So the presentation that I am giving today is creating Creating Black Worlds, looking for new realities in gaming. And like I said, it's largely going to be talking about my book project, Gaming and Blackness. Sorry, not Gaming and Blackness, old title. Playing in Color, How Black uh, Gamers Build Worlds. And it's largely a book that talks about how Black individuals are finding space within communities that are often read as anti-Black and given you know dangers within the spaces i think the process in which they, these they make these worlds is absolutely fascinating but before that i'd like to talk a bit about some of the inspirations and sort of ways that i'm thinking so in 1993 octavia butler produced obviously the now classic novel parable of the sawyer it is a wonderful book that talks about the journey of the main character olamina and how she goes on about creating new worlds and new spaces for her in the side of a world that is already on fire the uh, the book obviously like if you were reading this in say like 2020 it read more like a newspaper as the world continued to burn i was also living in california <laughs> and a president that doesn't seem to care about anyone and and continues the the to to add to the fire but the premise and the thing that I love about the book is the ability for its main black character to find and build a home within the fire, within the burning fires of the world. And if you play video games, you might understand that it's consistently burning. However, building within the ashes of the fire is something that is very common to black life and the history within the u.s hush harbors have served as spaces for individuals to practice religious freedom and enjoy one another's companies during times of slavery you have examples like barbershops which individuals like norris uh Voris nunley have given us in terms of barbershops working as a sort of newer form of hush harbor where you can create safe spaces get the best shape ups find the best advice in life unless you go on a day where they're roasting people and you are that target of roast that is not a fun day don't be that guy you know just get your hair cut and get out <laughs> and spaces uh oh. like black neighborhoods uh the hood as i am colloquially uh referring to it right now in terms of environments that have been neglected but black individuals still find the ability to create life space beauty and consistently find homes and build culture into spaces that have essentially been left to die, but continue to, to thrive nonetheless. Now, let's turn the sound off this while you watch this stock footage. Now, <laughs> essentially, within the world that we live in, one could argue that the world has been burning for a very, very long time. And despite these contained apocalypses and major and awful events within black history black individuals have still been building new ideas and new worlds of thought consistently in ways that they can find their space and make a living no matter what the situation is however now with the introduction of the internet and the video games we have now been given new worlds to explore and as you can see within the back the, the stock footage there the these worlds are massive they're huge they're amazing for so many ways but just like how in many cases we've experienced many real world fires we are now dealing with the reality of many digital fires in that representation in these games are often lackluster but more so than the representation and the sort of environment that it builds it comes down to the point where the worlds the communities the spaces whether that be on world of warcraft or on twitter or on discord have essentially been a place that is toxic and often untenable for black existences in many cases. So a lot of what I do or what I'm thinking through within my research as conducting a digital ethnography throughout the pandemic and after 
is how are black individuals creating the spaces that allow them to exist in gaming spaces? Why are they keep coming back? How do they form the friendships, the identity, the communities that are surviving within these problematic spaces? And how are they building uh, up their communities? But during research, what I came to realize that while individuals were surely building communities in these very specific ways, a lot of it was often referred to in separate worlds, often in their differentiation between white space and black space and commenting that white space was a completely separate world from that of black environments and thus black worlds must also ex create their own space. And this was a fascinating thing to come about uh, so I've started developing more theory and ideas around what does it really mean to create black worlds and what does it really mean to exist within these gaming spaces where many of these individuals have never met each other physically but are still finding community and family nonetheless. Now, let's go to the next slide. Now, this brings me to the main premise of playing in color, which is largely the idea of, of black intermediality or what I'm essentially referring to as world between worlds and the realms between realms, because essentially what black individuals were doing when they were forming their communities and their spaces or what they came to consider worlds was that it wasn't just a Facebook group that was, you know, black planet or black multiverse. It wasn't just a Twitter space. It wasn't just a discord group that was existing, but rather it was a combination of these multiple spaces and games that they were using in order to exist. It, you couldn't understand what black world was, which, pseudonyms I'm, I'm providing <laughs> in many of these cases, but you couldn't understand what one of these black worlds were without understanding the many passages and pathways that made the, this world work. Essentially what these worlds existed in were between networks. So, and it allowed them to have some level of defense or protection around many of the other sort of qualms and issues that a larger white gaming space would would uh, provide them. So that say if one was playing Overwatch and had a sort of racist interaction, then one could hop into World of Warcraft. If one was having world and issues in World of Warcraft, they can go to Call of Duty. However, but to maintain their friendships and their networks, they utilized all these different social media sites, communication sites, and video games in order to construct what was essentially the world, and thus what I am titling Black Intermediality, or rather the, the, the worlds that are built in between these literal virtual worlds and social media sites that allows them to exist within many of their spaces. Now, as I begin to, to finish up and, and bring down as I don't want to, to take up too much of the of the time here and understanding this. This idea of black intermediality is something that I have built from multiple uh, academic and, and theoretical sources, specifically when writing the, the the proposal, my dissertation and all the work that I've I've come through. Ruha Benjamin takes a quote within one of her books and saying, you know, build the worlds that you want to see. And that stuck with me throughout the consistency of my work because these individuals were taking up that that call and building the literal worlds that they wanted to see. And if anybody would like to hear more about the specific world, some of the examples being black folks that found no representation within games like Pokemon and thus decided to make a, a, a their own Pokemon world, but not by literally creating a sort of mod or version of the game, but rather using their social networks in order to more or less role play Pokemon space that allows them to create their own black gym leaders with their own themes. Some of them consist of worlds that created much of the inequalities that they were trying to escape from with men and, and uh, women practicing forms of homophobia, transphobia, massage noir in many of these cases, and some that were built upon therapy and trying to find the best communal spaces in many of these cases. So what the book is essentially trying to do is trying to understand and make sense of the fact that, of course, blackness is not a monolith. It is not one there's not one form of being of being black but rather the response to anti-blackness and racism has been varied within the constructions of these worlds and these worlds then allow for the idea or building of what is or isn't a safe space for black individuals online now with all of this, there is lots of conversation to be had in terms of what networks were, were made possible, what spaces sort of had, I would say, the majority of many of these Black spaces. And as an anthropologist, of course, the idea is to research narrowly but think broadly. But 
I do hope that in our coming conversations that we will consider, we will think not just about the ways in which we create games or representation, but then the ways in which these games are built upon and used for these individuals to find space. Because even games that don't have black representation are being used as part of these as part of these black worlds and are thus being put into the sort of fugitive, fugitive practices that black individuals are engaging in in order to survive many of these many anti-black spaces. And while survival was the beginning premise of my work, I do want to bring attention to the fact that these worlds, while they are in response to anti-blackness, they are not defined by anti-blackness. They are spaces that have been created with a love and beauty of engaging with black community outside of what it is to be related um, outside of its, its sort of colonial relation with whiteness and these gaming spaces, despite what they, whatever issues they may have, are providing black individuals the opportunity to explore that black identity when it is removed uh, from its connection to whiteness. So all of this, I hope that we'll continue to explore as the next conversation goes, but I will end it here and say thank you. And all of this is my information, my space. If you want to follow me on Twitter, I mostly just rant about my kids and how they they, they were late for the bus. But either way, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. And I appreciate your time, everyone. Thank you so much, Keel. Um, we'll hold all questions for the end of the presentations. Um, if you'd like to type one in the chats or uh, let us know in the chat that you have a question. We'll put, we'll put you in the queue that way. Um, but uh, now let's let's hear from Cyan DeVoe. Thank you. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. I assume that my screen is now shared now and everyone can see it all right. Uh, but yeah, I'm Cyan. Uh, it's it's so great to, to meet all of y'all. Thank you so much for including me in today's event. Uh, today, I'll be chatting a bit about the research I've been doing surrounding Black users in social VR um, and avatars. Uh, since I already received a lovely introduction, I'm going to skim past this slide, uh, but just want to quickly mention that a lot of my research so far, my PhD, has surrounded topics of embodiment, identity, and also learning within the context of immersive virtual environments. Uh, one context that has uh, taken a specific spotlight in my work so far has been social virtual reality. Uh, for those unfamiliar, social VR is an emerging ecology of immersive virtual worlds where users can socialize with each other through head mounted displays or HMDs. And unlike traditional desktop only uh, based virtual worlds, um, HMDs enable a novel form of avatar mediated interaction where users physical movement movements sync with their avatars movements. This concept known as visual motor synchrony can make communicating in virtual reality feel similar to face to face communication and the experience of wearing an avatar feel very personal uh, because instead of just viewing um, your avatar on a computer screen, uh, users experience their environments through the eyes and the body of their avatar. Um, so this high degree of immersion and embodied form of avatar mediated communication uh, distinguishes social VR from its uh, less immersive counterparts. It is also worth noting that users experience presence, um, which is the psychological phenomenon characterized by this feeling of being there. Um, one can feel presence within their environment, presence with other people, and also presence within their avatar. Um, and notably, this experience of presence within their avatar in VR is experientially different than uh, less immersive games. So this, in my view, uh, suggests the importance of studying avatars, digital self-representation, as well as identity within this immersion context. That said, um, what's been lacking in the still emerging area of social VR research is, you know, studying race and also the experiences and perspectives of uh, Black users in these environments. Uh, in particular, to my knowledge, there's been little research on the multifaceted and intersectional experiences of Black users in social VR, um, how this high degree of immersion shapes racialized experiences of users, as well as just viewing social virtual reality as, as an emerging backdrop for Black digital praxis. Moreover, while previous research has uncovered how racial biases um, 
exist in traditional virtual worlds, um, less attention has been given to how biases manifest in this more immersive medium of social virtual reality. Um, with that in mind, uh, you know, what I've been exploring in my research so far has been exploring like what are the racialized experiences of black users in social VR. Uh, my work is informed both by intersectional tech and grounded and self discrepancy theory. Uh, Dr. Gray's intersectional tech is a framework um, that makes sense of the visual, textual, and oral engagements of Black users in gaming. You know, originating from the digital and going into the uh, starting in the physical, going into the digital, and then vice versa. Um, and then also Dr. Higgins's self discrepancy theory is this idea that the greater the discrepancy between different domains of the self, um, it could lead to a greater psychological discomfort. So with these motivations and theories in mind, I conducted stu two studies with different methods. Uh, the first was a virtual ethnographic study and the second was um, an experimental study. Um, in today's presentation, I'll present on both of these studies um, that are currently at different uh, stages in the research process. So first, the ethnography. Um, so this virtual ethnography took place on one of the most popular social VR platforms, VR Chat, um, and it involved spending many hours in VR Chat where I played it myself. Um, I interviewed 43 VR Chat users and I did participant observation through attending events and um, hanging out with other users. Uh, I used grounded theory as a framework where earlier interviews and sessions uh, inspired the questions I asked in later interviews and also the topics that I'll be presenting on today. Um, and as I continued in this process, I found myself circling around a few specific research questions. Uh, first, uh, you know, what are the barriers to racially inclusive avatar systems and cultures um, that exist in social VR? Uh, two, how do users of color navigate, negotiate, and respond to avatar-based racial inequity in social VR? Um, and three, what are the unique and embodied consequences of avatar racial disparities in social VR? Uh, based on these questions, I collected interview data until saturation was reached and recurring themes were identified. Um, I mentioned before that I interviewed 43 uh, VR chat users, uh, 20 of which self-identified as a person of color and 11 of which self-identified as black or African. Um, and while all participants informed my thinking and the evolution of this project, uh, the paper that I'm in the process of getting reviewed, um, centers the perspectives of the participants of color and in today's presentation I'll be centering the uh, perspectives of the black participants in this study. Uh, but before I detail the findings, I just want to lay out the mechanics of how people obtain um, avatars in VR chat, um, just as a bit of context. Um, so there are about five ways about the time I conducted this study. The first was that you can get one from an in-game avatar world that was public. Um, two, if someone had their cloning feature turned on, you can clone an avatar that you saw someone else wearing. Uh, three, you could purchase an avatar from an avatar creator and upload it to VR chat. Uh, four, you can make your own avatar and upload it to VR chat. And five, you could download a mod, which technically wasn't allowed, um, and it allowed you to search through a database of publicly available avatars um, that you can then embody. So, you know, kind of given the nature of all of these different options and how all the avatars available on the platform were made by its users, um, avatars are ingrained into the social fabric of VR chat. They become the site for connecting, uh, play, community building, as well as exploring identity. Um, and this also distinguishes VR chat from some other social VR platforms that use um, exclusively a user customization interface. So, on to the findings. Um, so one of the first themes um, identified was this default of whiteness as standard in uh, the platform. Uh, one of the first things that became immediately salient was this predominance of white and light skinned avatars available on VR chat. Uh, there's this one quote by a participant that reads, uh, we do have many different types of avatar species styles, but you must keep in mind that there are more of these avatars than ones that represent black or brown people. Um, they felt that it was easier for them to be non-human than it was to be black or brown in this virtual environment. Um, additionally, interviews revealed a theme of defaults of whiteness in how the humanoid avatars were created. Um, and I have two examples to illustrate this. 
uh, first, as a result of a specific update to VRChat, some of the avatars on the platform are customizable in-game through the use of toggles. So while these toggles can be used to do things like um, customize the accessories of an avatar, um, some avatar creators choose to add toggles to allow users to um, change the skin tone of their avatar. Um, so you can see two examples of this on the left-hand side. Um, however, the ability to customize an avatar skin tone was infrequent, and from what I observed and from what my participants observed, um, it almost always defaulted to um, the, the white version of the avatar. Um, therefore, for users who are trying on new customizable avatars and preferred a darker skin tone, uh, they'd have to go through the additional steps of opening a few menus to toggle the skin tone to change it. Um, a second example of this is exhibited through the technical issues that would sometimes occur in the darker skinned avatars, but not their lighter skinned counterparts. Uh, for example, one participant showed me um, a black avatar model that they had with the hair turned off by default. Uh, meanwhile, none of the white versions of this model had that same issue. Um, so these scenarios kind of me um, represent this physical manifestation of a default of whiteness that exists within um, this avatar system. Um, and also how instead of just, you know, seeing a glitch occur in your avatar, um, one has to embody it in social VR, which I think is a unique implication of the medium. Uh, the second theme surrounded uh, the cost of navigating racialized um, avatar disparities and experiences in VR chat. Uh, you know, for some context, many of the Black participants I spoke with um, expressed this side the desire to embody um, avatars reflective of their uh, racial identity with characteristics reflective of that. Um, this included a participant who wore predominantly furry avatars, but made the remark that, hey, like I've never come across a furry avatar that had an afro. Um, you know, that said, I also want to note that the avatar practices both exhibited and observed by Black participants um, were not monolithic and were varied. You know, some preferred to wear exclusively Black avatars, whereas others would, you know, sometimes wear non-Black or non-human avatars for a variety of reasons. But I do want to also point out that some of these reasons included just the lack of diversity on the platform um, and also just as a survival tactic to avoid racial harassment, um, just acknowledging how wearing an avatar with a darker skin tone could make them more vulnerable to receiving racist attacks, especially within um, public worlds. You know, with that said, for those looking to embody um, Black avatars, they had to navigate VRChat's user-generated avatar culture. Um, since the users were the ones responsible for generating the avatars that existed on the platform, their biases, as well as the biases of society and popular media, are then in turn reflected into the avatar content available. Um, and, you know, despite some strides being made by the avatar creator community to do better when it came to diversity, uh, participants still did note some resistance from creators in making avatars with non-white appearances. Um, especially there are scenarios in which people of color would try to request one. Um, they'd often, it wasn't uncommon to be told by avatar creators, um, no, that they have to edit it themselves if they wanted their avatar to be brown, um, and then also providing with them little instruction on how to do this, which for people who aren't avatar creators, it isn't necessarily the easiest thing to do to edit an avatar because it involves a technical skill set um, and a knowledge of like 3D software. Um, so, you know, this issue overall had people had different views on this, right, where some were viewed this as a microaggression and others saw it as like, hey, no one can be forced to create an avatar that they don't want to make. But in all what, what it represents is despite what their perspective was, um, they all had to kind of navigate this racial bias that existed on uh, the platform. Um, oh, I also want to note that uh, one consequence of this uh, was where there's this avatar creator who said, I've been privately messaged so many times because people who buy avatar models and want to make them brown but have no idea how to, um, they sometimes give up and uh, waste their money. Um, as a result, um, some of them turned towards needing these DIY solutions in order to craft um, their ideal virtual self. Um, you know, they would learn avatar creation, learn, you know, Blender, learn Unity in order to create avatars representative of themselves and also to create avatars that helped other people represent themselves. Um, that said, participants also did highlight that there are disparities in terms of the tutorials and assets um, needed to create the Black avatars. Um, so um, to sum up this theme, uh, 
um, it really showcased some of the more conscious identity choices um, and considerations being made by Black participants, um, especially compared to some of the um, responses that I received from white and white passing participants who describe this privilege of not having to think about the lack of racial diversity on the platform. And going into my third research question, I tried to better understand how the consequences of the lack of diversity might be unique in VR. Um, some participants described feeling more immersed in their VR avatars compared to avatars in traditional games. Um, and with this context, amidst some other interview responses, uh, we found that avatar racial discrepancies can feel particularly salient, salient in VR. Um, P participant 40 and participant 42, um, they described how wearing avatars that did not align with how they wanted to represent themselves um, could bring them out of their sense of immersion in VR. Two quotes I want to highlight, one from participant 40 that reads, when I first tried VR, I was like, wait, this is cool. That's actually me moving my arm. That's actually me moving my body. That's me doing those actions and stuff. So it's like when I'm in these avatars that don't really look like or represent me, it feels like I've been placed in someone else's body and it's kind of weird um, and creepy, kind of creepy. Um, and there is a situation for participant 42 where they were cloning a darker skinned avatar that they saw their friend wearing, but when they wore it defaulted back to its white skin tone and then they exclaimed, oh my God, why is it white? Um, so some takeaways from this first study were the following. Uh, first, we uncovered how racially biased avatar systems manifest in social VR, showing that um, inclusive representation goes beyond just diversifying the avatars available, but also that hierarchies and inconsistencies between avatars can reveal social exclusivities that exist within the system. Uh, second, we saw that uh, when avatar systems failed in providing racial diversity, uh, users of color, Black users, um, can take on additional burdens burdens uh, working around the non-inclusive environment and also just filling it, working to fill in the gaps. Um, and then finally, avatar discrepancies can feel salient in immersive VR and affect avatar embodiment. These findings inspired the second study I worked on where I was interested in diving more into the psychological experience of avatar embodiment um, and salience of discrepancy in VR um, using some quantitative measures in addition to qualitative um, in particular, I asked the research questions, how does discrepancy between physical attributes and virtual attributes influence Black users' psychological experience in social VR? And also, how do Black users' racialized experiences of avatar embodiment manifest within social VR? Uh, to explore this, my lab recruited 41 participants who self-identified as Black, both monoracial and multiracial. Um, they were between the ages of 19 and 42, uh, 27 self-identified as female, 14 self-identified as male, all self-identified as cisgender. Um, most of them um, at the time of the study never or rarely used social VR prior to the study, um, and most previously tended to create avatars that were either similar or idealized versions of themselves. Uh, during this one hour in person studies, participants first customized an avatar uh, that looked and felt like them. They were given that specific instruction um, and they used Ready Player Me to do this on a computer. Um, so it was a customization interface that they used. Um, after that, we uploaded their avatar to VR chat. Um, and next, they spent 20 minutes in social VR, either solo or in groups of up to three. While in virtual reality, they completed three different tasks. Uh, first, they did an avatar familiarization task where they did a set of poses just to get acquainted with their avatar body. Uh, next, they completed a social task where they chatted with either other participants or a researcher. Um, and lastly, they completed a 3D drawing task where they just drew with a 3D pencil. Uh, during this activity, uh, participants were randomly assigned to um, one of two mirror conditions where a virtual mirror was either present or absent throughout the duration of their session. Um, and the goal of this con these conditions were to just manipulate the visual salience of their avatar. Um, and then lastly, they filled out um, a questionnaire survey about their experience. The data collected throughout this study included uh, video recordings of the avatar customization and in VR sessions, um, in-person observations, and of course the questionnaire items. Uh, there were a number of theoretically motivated psychological constructs assessed in this questionnaire that we hope to examine the relationships between. Uh, this included the state of self-awareness, avatar embodiment, 
social presence, spatial presence, um, avatar discrepancy, which is this measure of the distance between the avatar self and the physical self. When creating this measure, we specifically included um, specific attributes that have been shown to be um, important for representation and especially important for representation among Black users in virtual worlds. Uh, additionally, we measured uh, self-affirmation and avatar realism. Uh, this questionnaire also included a number of writing responses uh, just surrounding their social and avatar experience. Uh, data analysis is in progress, so uh, you know keep an eye out for future updates uh, when I eventually um, you know write up the findings that come from this study. Uh, but in conclusion, you know, while acknowledging that yes, progress has been made when it comes to avatar racial representation, uh, you know, racial disparities still do exist within these worlds um, and are evolving into new mediums. And I think it is important for the stakeholders um, within this just to take note of uh, both the similar and unique ways that racial biases are expressed within these newer immersive contexts of both virtual reality and also augmented reality as well. Um, quick acknowledgements to all of my colleagues, professors, RAs who have helped me, supported me, or provided feedback to me as I've been working on these projects. Here are the references of the uh, works that I cited in this presentation. Um, and thank you so much for your time. Uh, my contact information can be found here, and I look forward to answering your questions during the Q&A portion. Right. Uh, thank you so much, Cyan. Uh, once again, if uh, anybody has any questions from online, feel free to, um, you know, either type them out in the chat or let us know in the chat and, and we'll put you in the queue. Um, and uh, we'll save those for after the last presentation, uh, which, which we'll hear now from Stephen Dashel. Thank you. Great. Thank you. OK, let's see. There we go. Well, they say save the best for last, and this presentation is definitely last. So <laughs> we will go ahead with it. My name is Stephen Daschle, and um, thank you, Dr. Voorhees, for that wonderful introduction. Just a little bit more about who I am. I am a sociologist, an interdisciplinary sociologist who studies language. I'm also a practice theorist and a big follower of the work of uh, Pierre Baudu, and a lot of post-millennial uh, critical realists. I study masculinity and gender, and I particularly look at game culture. I don't study games. I don't even really study gamers. I study the culture in which games happen and gamers play, and think about the interrelationship between gamers, games, and the culture that generates them. So a lot of it looks at language and actions. That's what I tend to analyze. These are just a couple of the recent articles that I've done. I was lucky enough to publish in the conversation about uh, Hogwarts Legacy, some other articles that were published over this past year. I'm going to apologize beforehand just to say that there's a lot of words. You know what? No, I'm not even going to apologize. Yes, there are words here. If you didn't want to read words, you shouldn't have come to an academic presentation. So there are going to be a lot. Just go with it. I look at gaming spaces and uh, assumptions about them. In a paper that's currently under review and um, about to come back to me, I think in the next month or so, from a journal, I uh, speculate two different topics, one being gaming doxa and gaming exceptionalism. Doxa, doxa is the unspoken assumed concepts that are true about gamer space in general and the gamers specifically, born out of stereotypes and understandings of those who participate such as the idea that gamers are all nerds, gamers come from this space where they have been recognized for their intellect, they, they are outsiders to a degree. That leads to gamer exceptionalism, which allows for the formation and perpetuation of a narrative that because of these elements of gamer doxa, such as nerd population and people that are more into fairness because they've been discriminated against because of their nerdist nature, that gamer subculture is going to be naturally more diverse than the general population, and social instances of deviant behavior will occur at reduced rates. My paper points out how all of that is not true, but that doxa and exceptionalism still persist in terms of gaming culture and are reinforced. However, gaming spaces are becoming more diverse and signaling more diversity. Hogwarts Legacy, which I wrote the conversation article on, gave a lot more 
access to individuals, particularly in terms of skin color and hair texture. And there were a number of black in spaces that actually spoke very positively about that. And Baldur's Gate in terms of not only racial representation, but also the idea of representation of sexual orientation and gender being far more broad than it had been in the past. Now there's a lot more negative stuff being said about BG3 now, but we're not getting into that. So in looking at populations, I particularly am looking at nowadays African-American men and talking about the idea of expectations, assertions, and how statistics affect that. Two very important concepts. Uh, Ferguson's work, um, her book was called Bad Boys, and if you haven't read it, then shame on you. But she comes up with this conversation and topic, which is adultification. And adultification talks about this idea that particularly young Black men have this expectation that's put on them through the broader society that they are supposed to act better, be far more mature, be more significantly man-like than their contemporaries, their peers of other racial groups. Latino boys get the same issue, but the comparison that Ferguson says is this doesn't happen to white boys. And she points out the fact that if an issue is presented in the news that and an African-American young man from the point of view of 12, 13, 14 does something, they're referred to as young men or men, whereas if it was someone who was white, it would be a young person or boy. Uh, Nugent and Anthony talk about the idea of authenticity and the importance of authenticity in the African-American community. What does authenticity looks like? look like? What does it mean to be authentically black? What does it mean to be authentically anything? All of that plays into this interrelationship that I talk about in some of my newer work and the idea of black male exceptionalism that came from Butler. And Butler says there are these damning statistics about black men, like one out of every three black men under the age of 50 are incarcerated. Black men are the lowest population uh, to uh, finish the first year of college. And that these serve as controlling images and controlling ideas for African-American men. So they have to live their life in collaboration and in defiance of this black male exceptionalism, according to Butler. I came up with the idea of masculine gender capital. I didn't come up with gender capital, but I talked about the idea that there's specific gender capital that is valued when it's done in the embodied male form and the elements of those embodied male form and how the, there are expectations about that. In a lot of my work, I talk about the idea of masculine gender capital. And then Carter talks about the idea of black cultural capital. There are pieces of culture that have currency and value in the African-American community. And recognizing those speaks to the idea of the way in which you are able to intersect with authenticity. As such, that means that when we're talking about black men, I speak about this idea that it is this intermix between black cultural capital, black male exceptionalism, and masculine gender capital, specifically black masculine gender capital, that forms into this idea of how there's an interaction with black masculinity. That becomes important. There's also the work of Patricia Hill Collins who talks about black manhood as a fluctuating structure of power, that it's not about black men being subordinate to one particular group, but recognizing that when black men travel through the social strata, they have varying levels of power. And in some spaces, black men have more power than black women. Some spaces, black men have more power than Latino men. Lots of spaces, black men have more power than nobody. And there is this formation of what Hill Collins recognizes as black hegemonic masculinity, which she ties to the work of Ray Wynne Connell, which is extremely important in any understanding of masculinity. Bell Hooks in two of her books talks about the social structures and their impact on African-American men and this whole interrelationship between the ability to express emotion, how emotion and that lack of expression of emotion forms the idea of masculinity and how that impacts on future relationships. And then Neil, Anthony Neal's book, which is looking at the idea of realness and realness really relates to this concept of authenticity and how that plays into the identity and the internalization of identity specifically in African-American men. So black masculinity is then constructed and reified right beside white and, uh, or generic American masculinity, black femininity, and historical structures 
that define how we are supposed to read the black male body. How does all of this play into gaming? Don't worry, I'm getting there. Lack of generational wealth in the presence of black male exceptionalism requires the black, the vast majority of black men to be self-made men. So in other words, it's all about how are you going to be successful? How are you going to be able to provide not only for yourself, but for your community, for your family, for whomever? There's an idealization of ways to get rich or die trying. There was a very famous, um, oh gosh, it was in Chicago school systems about five or six years ago, and they asked particular young people something they did all the time, what do you want to be when you grow up? And at these two schools, they were slightly horrified because among young African-American men, number one and number two was sports star and hip hop artists. And the teachers were really upset because of this idea of like, well, these aren't possible, but Think about the ways in which these ideas are popularized, particularly in the African-American community. Historical practice has encouraged the, the value of blue collar work, particularly among black men. So hands on, I mean, think of every Tyler Perry movie where the woman eventually falls for the blue collar guy who really understands his life. And he may not have graduated college, may not have graduated high school, but he is seen as valuable, well, at least to Tyler Perry. But it explains the deficit of Black and Latino men in the college and university. The data tends to show that African-American men and Latino men are the two populations more likely to quit college in their first year. And we know from some co uh, correlating studies that part of this is because of this communication to Black and Latino men that working in academic spaces, doing something in academic spaces is not necessarily considered work. Aren't we glad I didn't listen? Then there's a correlation between hard work, potential success, and the need for black excellence. So this is in the back of minds in the creation and perpetuation of this idea of black masculinity. There's also, when we talk about gaming, this idea of the man child. This is not only about black men, this is about all men. There's a fear of men of the newest generation being drawn away <laughs> from their societal responsibilities by distractions such as video games. Senator Josh Hawley has gone off on it. I am not going to give him any more cred by reading this. You can feel free to read what he said. He actually wrote a book or somebody wrote a book and he put his name to it. And he talks at length about the idea of video games and how video games are killing masculinity. And gaming is easily attacked by politicians and the low-hanging fruit due to gaming violence. One of the biggest games that is automatically attacked and related not only to ideas of lack of masculinity, but in attacking urban and African-American communities is, of course, Grand Theft Auto. So when we talk about the black man child, more and more men are uninterested in marriage and education. That's across the board. We find men in general are less desirous of getting married and it's marred by decreasing participation of men in both, seeming to reinforce this assessment of the man child. The last two generations of men are responsible for higher numbers of saying they are either unlikely or never getting married. Data tends to indicate the number of working class white men going to university has decreased considerably uh, since 2019. And there's an effort to encourage men to move away from video games and center <clears> themselves <throat> in the social functions that could be and should be more fulfilling so, lest they become these man children. So where does this fit into my discussions of video games and African-Americans? There is a very, very weird relationship with African-American men and leisure and how we perceive African-American men who are involved in leisure. And the social constructs around leisure choices when inhabited by black men tend to be vilified more. So if a 29 year old black man plays basketball or 29 year old black man plays NFL Madden, he is not going to be treated in the same way as a 29 year old white man who is playing golf or a 29 year old white man who decides to play uh, NHL 2021. There is a social benefit to leisure, but if there's going to be all of this level of critique that comes to particularly black men when they engage in leisure, there's going to be a psychological wage of not being able to fully engage in leisure, which is going to have harmful overall effects for the development of the individual and eventually the development of culture. 
Uh, Kishana Gray said, because people of color are rec not recognized as legitimate participants in virtual spaces, disparaging those realities lead to existing, uh, lead to their exclusion in full participation of the community. There's also this othering of black men in gaming and outsider within, which is very related to Hill Collins, which I actually spelled wrong. How did I do that? Uh, there are struggles of a communitarian approach. When black men are involved in gaming or heavily involved in gaming, there comes this question out of the black community are of, are you giving back? What are you doing for the community? So there is this communitarian responsibility that we find particularly in black neighborhoods and black communities, also in Latino communities, and in some degree in Asian communities that leads to a level of speculation to people who are involved in gaming. Can it make money? Which is why there's this big discussion of esports and how that affects individuals in terms of gaming and black gaming or minoritized gaming. There's a need for acceptance of subcultural uh, related privilege, which is mostly based around white middle class norms. Aaron Trammell's book talks about the whole idea of network of privilege and how it's built out of norms of uh, white upper middle class men. And then there's the idea of black authenticity online and the role of verbal interplay, such as making fun of each other online, I'm on a couple of uh, sites where this happens all the time, and the use of AAVE online. That's not necessarily about this presentation of self, because as Simon pointed out, there are some limitations on how individuals can present oneself in a game. So there are other ways in which showing one's blackness and authenticity in gaming spaces that has to come out. And this is very evident, particularly in black male gamers. So what are the implications? Black men particularly are under scrutiny from both the macro standpoint, so being black men who are gaming, and the meso standpoint, which is being uh, black men who are gaming and part of the black community. So much of the gaming capital and network of privilege surrounds the integration of whatever practices those are, which tend to be in their formation white, but are not black. So it's about how do you mesh those together, but that puts a strain on authenticity. So in my dissertation about three years ago, I came up with this concept of constrained masculinity, not for this purpose, but hey, it serves. And it's about masculine performances caught between an intersection of expectations. And so the monograph that I'm going to be working on in the summer is going to be talking about this constrained masculinity, particularly among African-American men who engage in leisure. What are some avenues for research, deeper understandings of black masculinity, how black men interpret constrained issues, code switching in the sense that it's talked about collo colloquially, because if I said code switching, it's code switching to sociolinguists, they would just explode. And how that relates to gaming spaces, what it means to be authentic in gaming spaces and what that looks like, particularly for African-American men, and the internal differences. Both of the previous speakers, spoke about the idea that African-American community is not a monolith. So there are interfaces and differences from the point of view of class, from the point of view of education, from the point of view of identity that have to be investigated, even if we're talking about a subpopulation like African-American men. My upcoming projects, I've got a grant under review, looking at using a game. I'm more than happy to talk about that if anybody is even remotely interested. Uh, just closed data analysis on hardcore gamers and, data, uh, and Diablo. Um, I did a poll, got 870 or 880 people to do a really long survey on uh, gaming involvement and tabletop role-playing games. Um, I'm writing right now a paper on African-American men and discussions of dating on Reddit, which is going to kind of conceptualize this whole idea of constrained masculinity and throw it into the world. Um, I just put in a proposal uh, to talk about the appeal of MRA approaches, like the Andrew Tate type approaches to African-American men. And as I said, writing a book that's going to be looking at leisure and African-American men. That's me. Um, if you want to hold up your phone and uh, scan that QR, it will take you right to my academia page and you can see all of the horrific things that I have written. And um, if anybody has any questions, I am more than happy to talk about it. So. Thank you very much. Uh, well, thank you all for those wonderful talks. Uh, it was really great to hear from, from you all, Akhil, Cyan, Stephen, um, to hear about the diversity of, of topics and areas of, of inquiry that, um, that you as 
emerging scholars uh, you know, um, doing this great work are looking into and beginning to explore um, and really encouraging the rest of us to open up into as well. Um, uh, it looks like we do have a couple of questions uh, from the chat already. Um, and uh, if there are further questions, um, you know, please go ahead and raise a virtual hand or type something into the chat if you'd like. Um, but uh, I, uh, I, I suppose I'll read the uh, first question, uh, which is from Joe Tu, um, a, a GI resident here. Um, who uh, who says this is a very interesting, uh, very interesting results. Awesome talk as well. Uh, we're doing something similar to one of our projects, and one of the things we struggled with was the justification of present scales. Uh, there are multiple validated scales, but sometimes most of these scales don't fit for context. We're trying to build a framework and classify social VR traits. Um, how do you determine which scales to use? Um, directed to cyan in particular. Thanks for the question, yeah. Joe. Of course, thank you so much for the question. Uh, this is definitely something that um, I've been thinking a lot about, um, not even just regards to, to measuring presence, but also defining it. Um, for context, the scales that um, I used in these studies included um, Herrera and colleagues 2018. Uh, they have on the bottom of that paper um, self, uh, social, and spatial presence measures. Um, and I also used Peck and Gonzalez Franco's, um, I think, 2021 um, avatar embodiment uh, questionnaire to, to measure avatar embodiment. But as far as how the decision came down to it, uh, transparently, part of that decision came down to the recommendation of my advisor, who has been studying uh, VR for decades and as a recent is doing a lot of work studying social VR. Um, and I think part of that was like identifying papers with scales that where they had like either similar methods or studying like a similar topic such as social interaction in virtual environments. Um, but like in these situations where they, we identified items that didn't necessarily fit in the context of our study, um, we would just uh, modify them or adapt them. Or if we saw things like, oh, this item is double barreled, um, we would just modify it to um, you know, improve the measure. So um, the decision came down to the recommendation of my advisor, um, things that have worked well for my lab in the past, and, and modifying um, items that to make it fit more within the context of our specific study. Uh, yeah, thanks for that question, Joe. Uh, I do see another hand, uh, or I do see a hand being raised, um, but uh, I, I do want to go first to another question in the chat. Uh, this one is for, uh, for Stephen, for Dr. Daschle. Um, how do you see the recreational quote unquote tax that black men face affecting labor or gamified labor uh, where the line between recreation uh, and work blurs? Uh, and also thanks for the talk. Uh, thank you for the question, Logan. So number one, Logan, don't give me terms like recreational tax that I can steal and put in the book because you are going to see that in the book. That is a great term. No, it is, and it's a very good question about this idea of recreational tax. And I think what individuals who are African-Americans who deal with this idea of gamified labor have to do is the same thing that a lot of individuals, either in urban communities or mid to low SES communities have to do, which is when they have something that seems like a boutique career, that they have to go through a series of explanations to say, this is why it actually is worth something, and this is why it's actually going to make money. And it is a conversation that becomes internalized for people who actually fulfill that role, and it starts to build into this whole habitus where, and yep, another practice uh, theory term, a habitus where when you are in these spaces, you almost expect that individuals in certain parts of your own community are going to ask you. And so it, it becomes not even a defense anymore. It becomes a just natural reaction to the concern and confusion of the community that you are engaging in something that's not necessarily seen as a traditional form of providing for the community, unless it just happens to be horrifically lucrative where you're making so much money that people don't even question it. But beyond that, there is this explanation, there's this discourse that individuals seem to replicate over and over and over again in the community. And um, I think that's true 
of any individual that works in game labor. I think that's true when talking about African-American men who may like, for example, if somebody plays Madden competitively and they play like all the time, I think it's the same type of thing they have to do. I have to prove it's more than a game. I have to show that there is some type of, there's some type of capital involved that's going to provide something more. Otherwise it's going to be seen as and just dismissed as unnecessary. So great question and definitely something that comes up. Yeah, thanks Ewan. And uh, we do have another question in the chat, but uh, Angie um, has their hand raised. Uh, so I'd like to call on Angie. You can go ahead and unmute yourself to ask your question. Thank you. Hi, can you hear me? I have my earphones on. Can yes. you hear me? Okay, uh, this is for Steven. Um, as far as esports, it seems like more black men would play video games, maybe as per capita over other races. But as far as esports go, where do we fit in as black people? Like, what is the percentage? Because when I see it, I don't see us. Where do we fit in? That's a really, really good question. Honestly, if my postdoc were a year longer, I had actually proposed. Um, there's an esports group that's not too far away from American University that I was going to uh, get into ethnographic discussions with both the players and their parents to talk about that. But there is an insinuation that hasn't happened fully in African American communities with esports, and there's big questions as to why that is. Now, one of the thing is, uh, as somebody who's taught sociology of sport, is the price prohibition that comes along with it. Because there is time, there's effort, there's energy, and there's money that needs to be had in order to engage in this if there isn't grant money to provide for this. And unfortunately, in a lot of middle schools and a lot of high schools that are populated by minority individuals, there is not a lot of money or grant money for this. It's getting slightly better, and I don't want to get under the case or get in the mindset that it's a lot better now uh, because uh, I see three or four groups that are, are around um, American University because uh, Washington, D.C. is a city that's still barely majority African-American. So I I can see pockets of growth, and I hope that is going to be beneficial, but it is something that I really do want to look at. Let me finish my book, and then I will get there. So thank you. Yeah, thanks, Stephen. Um, and I seem to recall, um, I, I'm forgetting who, who wrote on this, but um, um, uh, somebody wrote on uh, black players uh, in the fighting game community, which seems to be an exception. Uh, to esports uh, in general, um, and uh, there there appear to be, I, and I think the top grossing player, for instance, Sonic Fox, right, uh, in, in the fighting game community, uh, for instance, is a Black American player. Um, but I, yeah, it's escaping me who, who wrote on that phenomenon. Um, but uh, yeah, thank you for uh, thanks for that answer and for that question, uh, Angie. Um, there's a question, another question in the chat, uh, another couple questions in the chat for uh, the first one, though, uh, for Akil. Um, and uh, the question uh, from Javon is, uh, in your opinion, what is the role that game developers, that game developers have in creating equitable spaces uh, for black and brown folks? That's always like the million dollar question of like, how do we do this to make this more accessible or how can we have more black folks in our games and make this happen? Um, I guess I'll, I'll freestyle this for the most part, as well as sort of like, I guess, answering a little bit on that last question, just having written a little bit on esports as well as the engagement there, right? So I think the developers in a lot of these cases need to take the lead of the players and the individuals who are engaging because for the most part a lot of the black folks that i was working with and uh, engaging with they have given up a lot of the time on developers representing them properly a lot of the time it just comes down to like critique or we'll use it or we'll engagement and there are moments of of love that happens when there is a great character that comes out but a lot of the times these video games are still very much using black bodies to tell white stories or creating spaces that are for the most part deliterous to black individuals so when a lot of these spaces show up black individuals aren't even so much worried or rather have just because they've given up on these spaces, they are then 
finding their own ways to make representation. One of the, the big uh, pieces within my dissertation, uh, something I, I termed reformatting blackness was the ways in which black individuals found representation uh, by sort of abandoning phenotypical blackness and then looking for identity within uh, something Cyan was talking about in terms of like animalistic bodies and non-human forms and things like that, where they can portray their own identity of blackness, but receive the sort of attention and care that a non-black body would in the first place. So it's sort of in the case of how everybody can understand, you know, why why it's bad to be, you know, prejudiced against the X-Men, but can't understand why it's prejudiced to be bad, uh, why it's wrong to be prejudiced against Black individuals. Um, and it's the very same thing that you see within sort of the esports community linking the questions there and that, yeah, the fighting game community is sort of the big space and folks like Javon and Reginald Gardner and other individuals at, at UCI are probably in, in the chat right now um, have done work on this because of the history in which the consoles have moved and fighting games have moved from, say, playing um, Marvel versus Capcom in like the barbershop and getting that quarter from my grandfather personally and then having those games exist in something cheaper like consoles which then can be afforded into the home and I hate bringing up that sort of like financial line of, of what gamings are but you then find all these black individuals creating uh, the spaces and things uh, within fighting games community which is again an example of we're not going to be represented in, in larger esports and things like that so we'll make it ourselves this also has the, the unfortunate results of these of it having way less publicity and of course black players not being able to make nearly as much as say a team uh, like cloud nine when playing league of legends and, and spaces where black individuals are not uh, highly represented. And of course, we can get into discussions of merit and all the other things like Stephen had brought up in terms of, you know, what goes into making a pro player isn't just one skill, but rather the the sort of social uh, networks that they can manage in order to, you know, play the game, get good at it, have it, the connections to get seen and all these other things. But the goal, I believe, that is for developers and companies overall is to support is to engage and when i mean literally support i mean they're going like if you care about change you're going to have to take a loss on money in some of these cases and be okay with investing in high schools and colleges and spaces where it is majority bipoc folk and give them the computers to give them the computers the games and the spaces to sort of build up is it kind of icky to to sort of give everybody computers in hopes that they will then play your game and then make it you know a sort of money line for for you know the black community into your company specifically lots of debates to be had within esports and things like that about that but you know if <laughs> it's uh, it sounds funny but there's there's just there's there's a level of reparations that need to happen uh for these communities to exist and these developers are going to have to be on board with that if they truly want to make the change as it goes on i'm going to mute myself before my toddler screams <laughs> Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that, Akhil. And uh, as you were speaking, it occurred to me that you've actually published right on on black players in esports. I, I wasn't thinking of you when I referenced the fighting game community, was I? Was that that wasn't your work, was it? I, I only mention it glib. The the article that the esports and the color line is mostly about the lack of black players in PC esports and happy to 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 get in on that as, as we can go back to the sort of arguments of meritocracy and, and gameplay and the differences of why some succeed and, and you have your Sonic Foxes and why others you have, you know, you don't have one necessarily in, P, in PC gaming. Um well depends, but you know, we'll 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 get to that. Great, great. Yeah, thank you. Um, and and by the way, there's some really great comments uh, in the chat from Rochelle, um, who's talking about some really cool initiatives um, by Gaming Community Co, a nonprofit that's working on getting uh, leagues up and running at historically black colleges and universities, um, funded by riot, funded with, by Riot and, and others, um, or with prize money from Riot, and others rather. Um, and uh, Rochelle says that uh, they've um, managed to get some community centers for students in Atlanta, DC, and Philly, and just built a lab at Howard University. So um, some really interesting news there uh, on the same subject. Um, there, uh, I don't see many hands, but I do see a, a few more questions in the chat uh, that I want to make sure that we get to. Um, and it looks like the next question, um, uh, the next question in the queue uh, is for the whole panel. Uh, we have one for Cyan up next, but the next question in the queue is for the whole panel. Um, how 
have you found any games that try to tackle issues of black representation head on in narrative? Uh, would more games like this be useful for gamers, for black gamers, um, or more so for non-black gamers trying to understand their experiences? Um, I'm currently debating this across all representation in video games. Uh, this question from Linda, thank you, Linda. Um, and I'll turn it over to, to whoever on the panel would like to respond first. Um, I can just say that I, I no games particularly come to mind, especially since I think some of my focus are on social games, social VR, and less so of narrative. Uh, but you know, just kind of in the work and literature review that I've done surrounding um, just diversity in gamings and players' perspectives on it, um, I do think that just in general, having that black representation is seen as both a good thing by both black gamers and non-black gamers, uh, who all generally agree that. Um, increasing diversity is a good thing, but I'll reflect more on if any other specific games to come to mind and I'll, I'll be sure to add it to the chat if I think of one. All I have to say on it is, and this is just me personally, I'm not convinced that games that speak more to black representation, that speak more to the black community and games that educate other communities about the black community and black representation, can necessarily be the same thing. Um, I'm more about function in that if you want to do something that really lifts up the knowledge of people outside of the black community, then that's got to be its primary function. And if you want something that really highlights the necessity of games speaking to the broad brush of the African American community, that's something completely different. Yeah. Um... So I think you make you, you, uh, Stephen made a good point there, right? In terms of it, because there are games that attempt to engage with sort of black ideology or black experiences, Mafia Three, Grand Theft Auto San Andreas, um, even uh, Riot just had their recent with you know the the last photo I had there was a picture of Echo um, with their Echo Convergence game, right? Where they often use black characters to sort of engage with what they believe the black narratives to be, which is usually a struggle, uh, hustling, coming up uh, out of poverty or, or many of these other things. Uh, Echo's Convergence was a little bit different in terms of, of, of you know, how it engaged and, and how it humanized Echo a lot more than, than a lot of these other black characters. But it was still largely a story of, you know, living within poverty and then, you know, finding the beauty in that space. And in that case, it's sort of a beautiful existence. Um, but a lot of the times where these games fall short is that they are, I don't want to start pulling out sort of like postmodernist uh, critique or theory here, but they're often dealing with like the sort of simulacrum of uh, black identity or what they believe the the sort of black experience is. So it is it is a black narrative then funneled through a white, uh, through a sort of lens of whiteness to then make it, uh, viewable or digestible rather to a larger white audience which doesn't necessarily have blackness in mind on its first case its first its first idea is to be sellable to a larger white audience because money which is okay i do think black stories should be able to be uh, you know i'm not going to get all thing but uh, to to be able to be ex existed with everyone but uh dr kishana gray loves talking about the 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 hbcu football game and right and how that didn't sell and how that didn't do well and that was just an unapologetically black game for its experience and folks are just like why are we playing through you know the halftime show but that is something that is incredibly culturally important to this sort of hbcu football experience so a lot of the times what happens is that there's a lot there's a there's a big distinction between a black video game that's for black people and a black video game that's made for a larger often white audience so yeah yeah, yeah, and just to, to add a little bit here, um, uh, you, you know, talking about representation, black representation in games, uh, and a pitch for um, our talk next week, uh, we'll have A.M. Dark, uh, professor at UC, um, oh gosh, I'm reading it, what UC they're located at uh, right now, um, but they'll be talking about their work on the Afro Hair Library. Uh, which is an attempt to ameliorate the lack of um, uh, hair options for black characters uh, in video games uh, by providing a library of, of those assets, um, as, as well as other projects that they're, that they're working on. Uh, that top talk will be uh, here at the Games Institute on Monday, and of course, uh, streamed as well. Um, uh, 
But uh, yeah, thanks. Um, and so the uh, thanks for that question, Luna. Uh, the next question that we have here in the chat um, is for Cyan, uh, directed for Cyan. And uh, um, Siani asks, uh, you make a point about has, uh, Black gamers feeling discomfort when playing in the bodies of white characters. Can you talk about the phenomena of white gamers who seek thrill uh, from playing like games like GTA that mirror the Black experience? Yeah. Um, but, thank you. Kind of question. Thank you. Oh, so sorry. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for the question. Um, I'm going to interpret your question a little, a little bit differently, just because this particular scenario is a little bit outside of the purview of what I've been studying. Uh, but there has been a lot of literature in VR surrounding uh, perspective taking, um, particularly in the context of race, and particularly in the context of white people embodying black avatars or non-black people embodying black avatars and seeing, um, you know, is, can that help them, um, you know, be more empathetic, right, to the other. And um, a lot of this research has received some critique surrounding the idea of like, you know, it's it's like the beyond, it's in this, this realm of the ultimate empathy machine where you can step into someone else's shoes, but it's been critiqued because, you know, just participating in a temporary, you know, VR experience that definitely can give you the experience of what it means to live in a black body every day. Um, moreover, it's complicated by the fact that these studies haven't produced um, long term behavioral change. Right. Um, and, you know, the fact that uh, a lot of this, the the study of race within the context of VR has been from this perspective of white bodies embodying black virtual bodies um, is telling as opposed to exploring the experiences of black users in these environments. Um, so that's like one point that I wanted to make. And the other point is I didn't report on these findings um, in, in this presentation or my in my paper, but I did have conversations with um, there were some white users of VR chat who chose to embody black avatars, whether it was like, oh, this is an avatar of a rapper that I really like, or even people who spoke about being attracted to black people. And that's why they chose to wear the avatar that they embody. Um, so, yeah, I think there's a lot to um, kind of disentangled a lot of a lot of nuance there. Um, but uh, yeah, in, in the paper and the research that I focus on, I tend to um, examine it more from the perspective of the, the black users. I hope that's helpful. Thanks. Can I, Thanks, Diane. Sorry, I was going to say, can I, can I follow up? I don't want, I know you said it's not your area of research, so I don't want to send you back down the rabbit hole, but uh, so for me, I got a lot of the same things, right? So when I was in Final Fantasy XIV, conducted research, and, and I was speaking to individuals about like why they weren't using black avatars or like how they were trying to express their blackness and like the 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 Rogar, the Lion people, or these other things. A lot of times, right? And one of the individuals would tell me that it was because blackness or black skin wasn't necessarily the defining feature of being black within this game, right? Because they had been in a guild because ERP or erotic role play is so popular in Final Fantasy where they use black bodies as essentially sex toys because one of the couples had a more or less a fetish for black men. So he would switch to his black avatar and they would use that within their role play. So he's like, clearly it doesn't matter if you have black skin or not. If because these because you don't know whether or not you're talking to a black individual in the first place so it can't be the defining factor so let me look for something else i'm curious with the the i, I, I mean hopefully it wasn't in the same way but in the avatars that you were you were talking to and, and things like that do you find that it was mostly from a point of appreciation was it still i mean obviously there's still lots of problems with that in many of these cases but like i guess like if, from what background were many of them picking up on their or, or like choosing black avatars <laughs> That's a great question. Um, and I think that uh, from what you're describing and, you know, I think what we see in the research is how important the context and the game itself matters. Like what does, you know, this particular avatar mean within this game, right? What form of currency does it provide? Is it part of the gameplay itself? Um, you know, uh, I think that, that the, the context is, is a big key here. And uh, speaking from the context of VR chat, be that being a social game, um, there are a couple, I guess, different viewpoints in which people chose as black avatars. Uh, for some of them, it was a matter of like, hey, like, you know, there's not a lot of representation out there. So it's important for me to be me in this environment. And to them, that might they 
specifically with Dame Call, I want the skin color to be like this or my hair texture to be like this or even things like body shape, right? So that was one context in which, you know, people thought about the representation of their blackness, uh, but also kind of through the lens of how, how they would be perceived, right? Um, you know, whether that meant like I'm going to be choose to be black or choose to be non-black based on like whether or not um, I think that I will be subject of harassment, I'll choose to be mute or not be mute, like even just thinking about voice and, you know, what that implies about race, gender, etc. Um, and that influencing how people navigate the environments. What community are they in? Are they in a public world versus are they in a private world? And what aspects of their identity, you know, um, whether it's visual, whether it's auditory or whatever, do they feel comfortable expressing based on the around of people that they feel they're around and how safe they feel in those environments? Um, so those are some of the different ways that um, it's come up and what, what I've been looking in so far. But context is key here, I think. I think that's true. Thank you. Thank you. That's great. Um, if I could just add two things really quickly before we get to the next question in the queue. Um, there, uh, uh, Dr. Andre Brock was here uh, in the winter talking about uh, uh, black presence in video games through voice. Specifically, um, you can find links to his talk as well as summaries um, on the GI website. Uh, there's a subsite on there uh, that, that contains several reviews <coughs> of uh, the previous talks from the speaker series. Um, and the other thing I would say is that David Leonard, uh, it's from 2003, so he's 20 years old now, but uh, he has um, a classic uh, article on um, uh, white players uh, playing in black bodies in, in video games. Uh, I think it's called, uh, it's a play on the PlayStation motto, live in your world, play in ours. Yep. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, so that that might be something else to check out. Um, there, uh, another question just appeared in the chat, but um, uh, or or rather, there's another question in the chat uh, that that I think we should get to before we get to the hands. Uh, it uh, it looks like it may have already been answered in the chat by somebody else. Uh, but if if uh, any of our speakers would like to speak to it, uh, the question is: Is there uh, a space or a hub or a social spot online where black um, where we can share uh, for black scholars and games, a social spot where we can share a network and talk more. Uh, and Javon points to uh, Trandria Rustworm and Samantha Blackman's Black Game Archive, um, which is an excellent resource. Um, I don't know if anybody wanted to add to um, or had anything else to suggest uh, regarding that. Uh, if not, then uh, we do have a couple more questions. Um, we have two more, two folks raising their hands uh, online, and one person here in person. Um, uh, the order of the queue is I'm going to uh, recognize Ontario online, and then we'll go to um, the in person question here. Hi, uh, my name's Ontario. Thank you for choosing my question. Um, I just kind of had a quick. Um, I think something I was wondering about, because I think throughout the panel, I had heard folks mentioning uh, ethnographic work and kind of doing things uh, within maybe an anthropological discipline. And so I'm wondering how autoethnography has maybe played into some of the research that you're doing, uh, or if any of you have experience with it, as I am wanting to make it part of my dissertation, specifically in my games chapter. Um, so it'd be really helpful to kind of get a little bit of feedback um, on things that you all have done, or maybe if you don't use it, why you don't use it? Um, I can give it a start. So um, my ethnography project, it was kind of, it, it came out of an ethnography class I had to take as part of my communication degree. And, you know, we spoke a little bit about ethnography in that class. And, um, I feel like as I was conducting my own ethnography, I was, of course, I was having this own autoethnographic experience that in turn, um, shaped some of the research questions I had as I myself was trying to find an avatar. And I was like, we're, we're, I can't, I can't find any like black women avatars. And, um, you know, it's, 
And even as I was talking to people, just being very conscious of how not only how I spoke, uh, but also the avatar that I wore would shape, um, you know, how people would respond to me or communicate with me, um, where I had access to, where I might not have had access to. Um, so um, there was this reflexive element of my experience that I cannot, you know, remove from how that shaped my interpretation of my results and even the research questions that I had. Um, in my paper, I did not necessarily necessarily dive into some of those uh, reflexive aspects, um, just kind of based on, hey, this is my first time writing a paper, and I just kind of shaped it more of like focusing on the interviews. Uh, but it is something that I think about as far as like how my presence, how I look, how, and my own experience, and how that shaped my research questions and how people even responded to me. I'll say I'm a qualitative researcher by design, and um, one of my major reasons, and this is going to make me sound like a real wimp, that I do not push autoethnography is because I recognize what the landscape is and that in publishing and in representation in a lot of uh, empirical work, quantitative is loved. Qualitative, sometimes you have to heavily defend it. And of qualitative, autoethnography is roundly criticized. And I do have to say that I, I, uh, I second guess getting involved in autoethnography because I recognize that doing a lot of interdisciplinary publishing, so in like deep social science and not so deep social science and humanities, that I've seen a lot of critique of autoethnography and saying, well, how is this not just a novel? And it is, it is, it is a very interesting tap dance that you need to do with autoethnography, and that can lead people like me to back away from the possibility of it. Um, so I'm going to be the resident anthropologist today. Um, so there's a lot of great stuff that can come out of autoethnographic work, specifically when researching spaces that are, what's the right word for it? Um, dangerous isn't the right word, but individuals that you that you want to protect, uh, especially vulnerable groups of individuals, things like that, it can be protecting to that space to give your own perspective while still anonymizing and using pseudonyms and doing all that other things to protect that space. That way, what you are critiquing and working on is your own uh, interpretation of the work. However, Historically, there's obviously been a big uh, sort of hullabaloo in, in anthropology on considering how to present one's voice within your own ethnographic work, because originally most ethnographic work coming out of it is just entirely, hey, I'm speaking for the native individuals. I'm saying everything that they, I'm suddenly an expert on their community. I can do it all, all everything that, you know, whatever. And then you have this sort of flip to the other side where you no longer acknowledge the fact that you are in fact influencing your research and then trying to write for them, which then both comes basically hits the, the same point of, of missing the voice. The sort of evolutions of interpretive anthropology in which that, you know, if you want to go by Geertz and that all anthropological knowledge is to a certain degree subjective and interpretive by that that way is important to understand. But I think there is a wonderful balance for autoethnography and the sort of engagement of, you know, allowing the individuals that you interview to have a voice and then having your own self because your voice while it shouldn't overpower, can provide a certain level of protection uh, for that and for that fact, and for the fact that yes, many projects are interpretive. It's you are at least being honest about where that voice is coming from. Um, but yeah, that that pitfall can fall. It, it can, you you just have to be careful for those landmines where it's just like you no longer let anybody else speak, and it's your own thing. And everything that Stephen said is true. If you're trying to work corporate and many of these spaces selling interpretive, uh, sorry, uh, autoethnographic work is going to be a lot harder of a sell because they just like numbers, right? <laughs> so even if the, even if numbers themselves are fully interpretive, they just like seeing them. So it is what it is. Uh, and we come to a very awkward moment where I have to apologize to uh, uh, one in-person guest um, and and to Angie online. Uh, because we are out of time uh, to uh, to get to your questions. Um, I'm, I'm so sorry about that, but I'm also so grateful uh, for uh, Stephen 
uh, Cyan and Akhil uh, for joining us today, uh, sharing their new and ongoing research, uh, giving us a glimpse into some of the important questions uh, that are being asked by these emerging scholars in Black Game Studies, uh, and frankly, important questions to the entire field of, of game and uh, new media studies as well. Um, so thank you uh, once again for joining us, uh, Akhil, uh, Cyan, Stephen. Uh, it's been a great pleasure um, and uh, uh, learning about the work that you're doing um, and uh, being a part of this conversation. Thank you so much. Uh, well, yes. Uh, so uh, once again, thank you. Thank you all for your talks today. Uh, it's been a great pleasure to, to meet with you and share conversations. Um, and um, uh, maybe one last round of, of virtual or real applause for, for our presenters. <laughs> one clap. <laughs> Thank you all. This was lovely. Uh, good one. Thanks, everyone. Thank